Hello again, I'm Henry T. And back again with inspirational stories. And today we're gonna fill you up again to the mountaintop. And soon you'll be running in, sh running in, in that one spot right there and running in places they call it in the boxing world and football world. And you'll be shadow boxing too. You'll be inspired is what I'm trying to tell you today because today we have the director of golf at Los Altos Golf Course. His name is Chris Moya and he has a story that you cannot miss a word. So you gotta stay right there. And the whole Moya family is here today. So more to come after Chris, but first, Young Chris Moya, how are you, Chris? And we're doing great, how are you doing? Fantastic. It inspires me, and I've been inspired ever since you and I spoke on the phone, mm -hmm. that you were gonna be a special guest here, because I know your story, a liver transplant that literally saved your life. But before that, I knew you as this active young man out there running around Los Altos Golf Course, starting whatever job they had at the beginning, now you're the director of the whole place. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Amen. It wasn't like it happened overnight, right? <laughs> there, there's nothing out there that you haven't touched or a job out there that you haven't done. Am I accurate on that? You're exactly right. Well, knowing the young life of the great athlete and the great golfer, and then of course so associating with your dad, Eddie, mm -hmm. and your uncle, Billy, who are outstanding players mm -hmm. and great businessmen too, you had quite a leadership in front of you to learn the ropes, as they say. That's true. I, uh, starting with my Uncle Billy, you know, he's been in Los Altos at, since the day it, it opened up in 1960. Um, I started working there early at an early age, um, officially in 1975, but a little earlier before that when I was a kid, taking out golf carts and picking the range. And then my dad was on board, and uh, together I learned a lot about business, a lot about treating human beings with respect, a lot about the game of golf. Um, so yes, they have been, they have, I'm sure they've forgotten more than I know, but I've retained a lot of what they've taught me, so. You know, that's probably the trademark of your business at Los Altos collectively with you and dad and Uncle Billy, is the service that you render to people out there. They come there, they feel like, what a warm and friendly atmosphere. People treat us with respect here. Plus it's fun, the golf course is impeccably clean and well manicured. A lot of pride from the family, the Moya family, to make the whole experience there gratifying. You're absolutely right. And I think it has been a cooperative effort through the years with my uncle, my dad, and now myself. Uh, working with the city of Albuquerque, having the same goals, trying to promote junior golf, trying, trying to promote uh, recreational golf. Um, so yeah, we have, we have, you know, it's been a process and we've had the same business partner for many, many years, in fact, decades. And uh, it, it's a great relationship. Um, the city has professionals on their end, manicuring the grass, doing what they need to do. Um, thank God this spring we had a great rain season. The summer kept going with lots of rain. So uh, the course has really been nurtured with rain and that's been great. So uh, yeah, definitely the city of Albuquerque has done their part. The Moya family, we try and do our part. And you're right, it's all about respect. Um, I still have people today that come up to me and they ask me, are you a Moya? And I'm saying, yes, I'm Eddie Moya's son, uh, my Uncle Billy's nephew. Well, I took lessons from Uncle Billy, or I took lessons from your dad, Eddie, and uh, he taught me a lot, but since they're not teaching anymore, um, if you're a Moya, you obviously have a little bit of knowledge, and I'm saying, well, I've got a little bit of knowledge, yes. <laughs> so I end up taking over the lessons that they started years ago. So wow. It's been great. Well, you're quite a player, quite an athlete. But things are moving along in the business, and you're going through your steps in your life. Mm -hmm beautiful wife at home, Angela, mm -hmm. and then something happened. That's right. Can you take us to that sudden day in your life that stopped you in your tracks? Well, back in 2009, I, had, um, I was sick. I was gaining a lot of weight. I was very lethargic. I went to the doctors here locally, and uh, they weren't quite sure what was wrong with me. They knew I probably had liver issues, um, but they weren't sure why. Um, so um, I called my wife, well, I talked to my wife and, and discussed it, and we thought, well, we better go someplace where they have a higher level of, of medicine, especially for liver. So um, we went to Phoenix, went to the Mayo Clinic, 
Um, and within four days, they diagnosed me and they said I'm in desperate need of a liver. My liver, uh, uh, due to conditions, uh, a, a condition called Wilson's disease, which you know I had ten of the eleven symptoms of, of that of that disease. Um, it it fries your liver, it literally to roast my liver. So um, I ended up having to uh, get on the transplant list over at Mayo Clinic. Um, their doctors were very helpful. They were very positive. They told me that you know the, the direction is going to be. You have a, a caretaker in my wife who's been by my side the whole time, never left me. I'm sure a lot of people out there, you know, who've been through a situation like this, a lot of people can't, they can't handle the pressure of helping somebody else. But my wife was a diehard. She, she was there by my side, took care of me, watched me, had my back. Um, and so we, um, together, they put me on the transplant list. Um, but I had a friend of mine who had cancer of the liver and he ended up having a transplant at Baylor Hospital mm -hmm. in, in Dallas. So um, we went ahead and we were on two transplant lists. Uh, I was on the transplant list at Mayo first in, in March and then I was on the transplant list at uh, Baylor Hospital in June. Um, so, um, you know, as you get sicker, um, your, 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 your necessity for a liver becomes greater and you climb up the list. So if you're number one on a liver transplant list, you're the sickest person at that hospital. So um, I wasn't the sickest person. I was about number three at uh, Mayo Clinic and number two at Baylor. And uh, of course, it takes a donor to give a liver and the gift of life for me to continue. So uh, um, a, general, a young man died and uh, I was his recipient. Um, and then I ended up getting my transplant in October of 2010. Yeah, he was, and, you, and in the process, and you're still taking meds, your health is, de is declining, you're deteriorating, you can do less of what you normally do, um, and, and pretty soon it's, it, you, you actually have to depend on another person for basic things. Something I've never been used to. Never, never, never ever had experienced that. During that time when the doctor had told you, you're sick, Chris, mm -hmm. this is what you had. Now we gotta get you a donor. In a time like that, do you go to your knees? Does it humble you? Do you suddenly no longer take things for granted, simple things, important things, important people? Does it change your life drastically? The first thing, when, when I was given the information, um, you, you have a, a moment of hopelessness, a moment where you just feel like, it's done, my life is over. You have to get past that. A lot of people who are out there who, who are experiencing some type of a disease or a condition that they actually see their own mortality right up right in front of them and they have a sense of hopelessness, that's when you truly, truly are humbled. That's when you truly, truly find a prayer inside. You, you talk to your maker. I, I, was, I talked to God. I had many conversations with God at that time. And... Um, it was, and I was kind of, kind of weird, but I, I, I was communicated that, you know, it's going to, you know, you're going to get a liver. You just have to, you know, part of this process of, of, of being humbled and uh, truly knowing what the meaning of life is, um, you're going to have to go through that. And um, I did, and I went through that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, then I got the news that I was going to get a transplant. And uh, I, you don't know the feeling of joy until you have that kind of news. Uh, you start to, you know, right before you get that news that you're going to get a transplant. You know, hopefully it takes, hopefully you have no problems after the transplant. But you start to really see what life is truly about. And it's not about possessions. Because I started giving my, you know, I had a couple of um, items that my, my sisters wanted. And I gave those to them without hesitation. Um, I had extra hunting rifles that I had and a shotgun that I had. That a, uh, that, a, um, that a relative wanted. And I had no problem letting go of those because they have no meaning at that point. Uh, all it is from that point on is taking it day by day, trusting that your prayers are being answered. Um, I had a ton of, of, of support from my family. They raised money um, through a golf tournament and a function, um, um, a banquet, that they raised roughly $35,000 between the golf tournament and the, uh, and, the, and the dinner. Wow. And so that truly helped my expenses when I was in Dallas because I couldn't leave Dallas. I had to stay there for all the treatments that I had to, uh, to go through 
um, the medications I was on. So, yes, it was. Uh, you, you, dude, so your question is, how does it touch you? How does it? How, what do you feel? Yeah, you feel a sense of hopelessness, and once you get beyond that, that it's not hope. It's not hopeless. That there always is hope, and you and you uh, come to grips with that, and you believe in it. Well, I'm here. I'm talking to you. So obviously, Amen. hope was there. What do you say about your relationship with God now, so other people can make their priority list similar to yours? I think that. Um, in the gravest of situations, like I was in, I, I think that you have to truly um, separate yourself from the life that you have now. The, the life that you have at that time, you have to separate yourself. You truly have to, to sit quietly, pray, listen, um, be at peace with whatever decision comes your way. Um, and, and in the hopes that if, it's, if your job isn't done on this earth, your prayer will be answered, and, uh, and you'll continue to do great things. You'll, you'll go out and touch people. You'll actually inspire people. You'll actually make a difference in somebody's life that you may not even know you do. Um, but you can't not ever lose hope. And I think that a lot of people, even in some, whether it be financial, whether it be um, family-oriented, whether it be uh, job-related, um, there is no such thing as a hopeless situation. There is no such thing. She can't be here today because of work-related interferences, but describe in our closing minute your beautiful wife, Angela. She is, um, I probably can't properly describe the, the tenacity and the drive that that woman has. She would not take no for an answer when it came to getting uh, uh, getting out of the state and going to a specialist. She was told it couldn't be done. She did it. Um, she said that there was no way that I would get a transplant. She stuck by my side and demanded a transplant. There was no, there was no no in, in that woman's thinking. There, there's no no. You see, there's, it's only yes and yes. How about now? <laughs> so uh, just, if I were to sum up one word um, for Angela, it would be God sent. That's all I can say. God sent. Rhetorical question, but answer it loud. Okay. How much do you love that lady? Oh, all my heart. All my heart. That's all I can say. There's no more room for, for uh, not even me. It's all hers. God bless you. Henry is good seeing you. Again. What a joy, Chris, to have you in here today. And we'll be hearing from Dad and your Uncle Billy mm -hmm. in just one minute. So. Hey, you inspired all of us. Thank you. And they've got their own inspirational story oh, coming up. Truly, truly. Are you kidding? They've got more stories. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Henry, good, good Chris being here. Moy, I told you he would get the job done inspiring all of New Mexico today. Great young man. And in a minute, we're going to meet Dad, Eddie, and Uncle Billy, two famous Moyas coming up right here on KZQ Channel 32. Stay right there. Funding for today's programming has been brought to you in part by Malloy Dodge, Albuquerque's new and used Dodge and Ram truck dealer since 1955. I'm Nick Malloy from Malloy Dodge. For four generations, we've been serving thousands of New Mexicans from all across our fine state. Over 65 years of trust. Our family serving yours. Malloy Dodge, we're proud to stand behind our community. Thank you for supporting family programming. Hello again, and let me tell you, we are honored today to have the Moya brothers, Eddie Moya and Billy Moya, two longtime friends of mine, who every time I see, they inspire me. Just by watching them, whatever they're doing, proprietors and managers, directors of golf for many years together, at Los Altos Golf Course, coordinating tournaments, inviting special guests to their facility, like Chichi Rodriguez, Lee Trevino. My goodness, what a history, and what a pleasure. Eddie Moya, great to see you it's again. How my, are you? My pleasure, sir. Billy Moya, Thank it's you. great to see Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Before we start, can I get an autograph from the both of you? <laughs> there you go. They're, you're and they won't cost you anything. No, you're not going to charge me. <laughs> And I mean that 
in a complimentary way because you've both been heroes to me, people that I've grown up to respect because of the way you treat people and the way you play the game of golf and the way you treat the game of golf with great respect. And any time I've ever been in your company, it's been so pleasant. That's kind of like your family philosophy, respect and service. Tell me that story, Eddie. Well, to me, family is the most important thing you have to uh, deal with. And you want to surround yourself with a family that's loving. And I'll tell you what, tribulations are there. My wife is on dialysis. She's been on dialysis now for 19 years. We have been married now for 60 years. And now it's my job to look after her because she's legally blind. And of course, she's got other problems. So love has to carry you through all of that. And actually, today, we love each other more than we did when we got married. So, and I have a wonderful family. So to me, that is everything. I have done, don't have the uh, great story that has, Chris has, but I started out my life going to the seminary. I attended the seminary for eight years, and I left, went to the Army, went to Alaska for two years. Then I came home, became a school teacher, and uh, taught school for 16 years. And then Billy comes along and says, help me run the golf course, I need somebody. And then I said, yes. I didn't realize how hard it's gonna to be to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go to bed at 10 o'clock every day. But anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And so now I enjoy teaching golf rather than teaching arithmetic and reading because you know the difference the difference being that the students come to you to learn how to go play golf and already motivated whereas the kids you have to mo motivate them to learn and wow. so that's a billy we just heard from your younger brother now big brother what do you have to say about the family success. Well, uh, first of all, I want to appreciate my family because they've been great for me and they stood behind me for all this time. And Chris and Eddie have been behind me all this time. And uh, I had a beautiful wife, beautiful family. We've been married for 65 years. Wow. <laughs> Incredible story. Yeah. You know, the game of golf has been your middle name as a family, running the golf course, Los Altos Golf Course. It looks so beautiful out there. So many people go there to play golf because of the kindness, your legendary kindness, the way you serve people there. What a story of being the, the people who literally identify with Los Altos. When they think of Los Altos, they think of the both of you and Chris. How about the golf experience, Billy? Well, I started out a year back when I was about 14 years old. I started getting at the Albuquerque Country Club. That was the only golf course in town. And we used to get it for 35 cents for a round, which in those days was pretty good money. Sometimes they give you a 10, 15 cent tip. So we felt pretty proud of all that. <laughs> so it's been a wonderful life for me in golf, and I enjoyed it very much especially working with our junior program that we had. Mm -hmm. I started the junior program at Los Altos way back in 1961, and today is one of the best programs in the, in the city. Mm -hmm. And I've, it's a good thing to because I enjoy working with the kids because a lot of times it keeps the kids out of trouble as long as you teach them how to play, you know. And it's a lot of fun working with kids, you know. And for all these years that I've worked with kids, I really enjoyed it. There, there. And, and Eddie, you're both so healthy today. 88, 92. What do you attribute that great health to? Well, a good living, you know, you, you don't abuse. You do everything in moderation. To me, that's the key. You, If you abuse uh, whatever, you know, uh, moderation is a key. And I think, uh, you know, longevity comes from your parents too, you know. <laughs> They kind of help a little bit. <laughs> you know, Brother Bill, how would you describe your brother Billy as a golfer, as an athlete? There is none better as far as hitting irons than Billy. At one time, he was the best. And 
you know, the amazing thing to me is that Billy never took one single lesson. He learned it all by himself. And now, he, you know, what I'm, was amazing to me, if, you, if Billy uh, gives you a lesson, he makes it very simple. He doesn't have 15 different things that you're gonna be um, worrying about. He's very simple in his approach, but he knows what he's doing and he's good. So that's, to me, it's an impression. You know, Billy is a sportscaster. You're the most boring golfer I've ever seen. <laughs> straight arrow, straight. You never go to the rough, you never go to the trap. It's always straight and long, boring. But I envy you because you're so good at what you. you do. God bless you. What's the secret to being such a great golfer? Well, like Eddie said, I learned it all by myself. When I was to Getty, we watched other players, and that's the way we learned. And in those days, we hardly had any clubs to work with. We had maybe had a two or three or four irons, and that's, that's what we played with. But I used to practice quite a bit. And I, the main thing that I practice a lot is usually on my chipping and putting. And that's, that's where you really make up to do a lot of your game. But, uh, Eddie, what kind of life have you lived? What has been the highlight of your life? Or the highlights of your life in one minute, minute and 30 seconds? Round it about and tell us the story. Joining my brother, my uh, brother Billy, and then taking Chris in in our company to run the golf course, that to me was the most satisfying part of my life. Wow. And then your wife and your family? Well, of course, they all part of it. You know, actually, uh, my daughter is also part of the golf course. Wow. She does uh, all the book work and all that. So it's been a family affair in the golf course and other and that. Really good. Yeah. Billy, how would you round out the highlights of your life? Well, mainly. Yeah, having a good family, that's, that's the main thing. You get a lot of support from them, you know. And there's other things that are, that are valuable too. I mean, good brothers and sisters. And you know, to live a good, clean life, that's the main thing. Amen. The highlight of your golf competition. Give me one day that you'll never forget. <laughs> yeah. Well, one, one tournament I don't forget was the one that when I won the Southwestern golf tournament at the Albuquerque Country Club. In those days, that was a big tournament. And uh, there's guys from Phoenix, the big shots and things like that. And I was fortunate enough to win that tournament. And then and I won two other tournaments at the Albuquerque Country Club. Of course, I knew that course pretty good. I was with a caddy, you know. <laughs> Makes a lot of difference. What's it like having a brother so supportive, so loyal as Brother Eddie? Well, when I need some help, I go to Chris or Eddie. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> they, they've been very supportive for me. Amen. Yeah. Eddie, when your son Chris went through that liver transplant, he was very sick. He needed a transplant. You prayed as hard as he and Angela did for that transplant. The day the transplant came for your son Chris, how did you feel? I'll tell you what, no one can tell you how the sorrow you feel when the news comes that there's a possibility of uh, fatality or you know, end of life, as no one can really tell you. And so you do turn to prayer. And so my wife and I spend many hours praying and it, your prayers are answered, that's for sure. And so that's a consolation. And then you have to be ready for the worst if it does come. You have to be resigned. Cope. The word I like to use a lot is the word cope. You have to cope with whatever life has in store for you. And if you can cope, then you move along. Wow. What do you think of this guy next to you, your big brother? I tell you what, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for anything. <laughs> No, I'm real proud of him. He really has been a, a blessing. Yeah. yeah. And I appreciate you uh, giving us the time to explain our uh, situation. You know, this is a monumental moment so. for all sports fans across New Mexico to have the two legends in here mm -hmm. together today. You've blessed me as a professional and as a personal friend to be here today. And Billy, I mean that because you know the many thousands of fans that you have 
across the country. What does that feel like to be admired as an athlete and as a friend? Well, it's, it's been a gift for me to have that many opportunities to meet people. And involve one thing about it, you meet a lot of good friends. You make, um, it's a good sport. And that's one thing that uh, it's amazing that people don't realize how golf is a tough game. A lot of people think it's easy, but it, you, you try it. I, mean, I, I guarantee you it's a pretty hard game. That's why you should always take lessons before you start playing. Amen. Learn it the right way. Hey, everybody else has had a critique on Tiger Woods. Why not you guys? <laughs> Is Tiger ever going to be the old Tiger again? Well, he had his day, and it was great. And I think that, you know, like Lee Trevino and uh, Jack Nicholas, they know when it's time for them to enjoy their roles, and that's what it's all about, because he can still play well, but boy, he's got competition that's tough. Wow. And so that's why, you know, you, you can't expect him to win too many more. Billy? Can Tiger beat Jack Nicholas records of most majors? Not at the rate he's going now. I don't think so. <laughs> That's <laughs> a very guarded pretty, statement. It's going to be pretty hard for him. <laughs> I tell you what, nowadays there's so many good golfers out there. Anybody, anybody naming Gay Day can win a tournament. Not only that, they're so good. I mean, the equipment that they have today is unreal for what we used to have way back in the 40s and 50s. That's why these guys, in any given day, any player can hit the ball over 300 yards, and that makes a heck of a lot of difference. What a joy to have you both in yeah. the studio with me today. Uh, I cherish our friendship, <laughs> and I, it's so good to see you, Eddie. I'd like to tell you one of those yeah. very quick stories. Okay. In the sixth grade, I had a fellow named Mike Walker, great athlete, good student, and admired him. Uh, anyway. He became my boss when he became the director of golf. Yes. And so that was a real nice relationship there. Now, he retired, okay? I'm still working at the golf course, and he came to me and says, Eddie, I need something to do. Could you please give me a job? Wow. <laughs> so I says, come on in. <laughs> well, anyway, that's kind of a... <laughs> Billy. Well, thank you, Andrew. It's your pleasure. What an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you. See you soon, Eddie. Oh, yeah, you bet. Hey, can you teach an old dog new tricks? You bet. <laughs> All right. do it. <laughs> as straight as you? Sure. <laughs> wow. Okay. Give me a Henry tea time. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Henry. Wow. Man, this is a special moment for Henry T to have the, these two legends here with us today and their wonderful son, Chris. Wow, we're blessed today, and we're inspired today. Right here on KZQ, Channel 32. 8.30, Tuesday morning, 9 p.m. Tuesday night. See you then. You have been watching another exciting episode of Be Inspired with Henry T. If you would like to support this program, please contact Henry at 505-907-4523 or email him at originalgameface at gmail.com. Watch Be Inspired with Henry T. Tuesdays at 8.30 a.m. and again at 9 p.m. on KZQ TV 32. Funding for today's programming has been brought to you in part by Marty Sice, a local State Farm Insurance agent. I am never getting married. Never. Guaranteed. You picked a beautiful ring. Thank you. We're never having kids. Mm -mm. Ah! I love it here. We are never moving to the suburbs. We are never getting one of those. We're never having another kid. I'm pregnant. I'm never letting go. Marty Size, 345-3431. Thank you for supporting family programming.